Well, hello everybody, and this is our um, fifth uh, program for the second initiation compilations. Not exactly sure how many pages we have left, quite a few really, I think. Um, seems to be covered up at the moment. But uh, we're working with um, quite a number of compilations, and we're going through the books in alphabetical order. So here is a statement about the second initiation um, and the second aspect of the soul. I suppose that has a lot to do with the love petals. At the second initiation, this great presence, this angel of the presence, is seen as a duality. At the first initiation, it's seen uh, not as a duality, but as a single factor of light and mind. But now another aspect shines forth before the initiate. He becomes aware of this radiant life uh, established on the higher mental plane, who is identified with himself. Notice that, because this is the capacity which the solar angel projecting itself as the angel of the presence has, the ability to identify with that projection of the monad that we know as ourself. So this radiant life who is identified with himself is not only intelligence in action, we would call that the third ray, active intelligence, but also love wisdom in origin. So two aspects of divinity shine forth. He merges his consciousness with this life <clears throat> who is underlying his sense of identity on this higher plane and becomes one with it. So that on the physical plane, through the medium of that personal self, the soul and in incarnation through the vehicles, that life, uh, that uh, angel of the presence is seen as intelligent love expressing itself. And this is, uh, I think, very much uh, a Venus experience because Venus, we know and understand with its fifth ray soul, and it's uh, sort of sixth ray, second ray monad is love and mind, or mind and love. Okay, so progressively we meet the fuller expression of the angel of the presence through um, the first uh, three initiations and finally the fourth, after which it, uh, its support of our consciousness and our development ends because we have absorbed enough from it to support our own uh, ongoing progress. All right, we'll go on. What is realized here at the second initiation? At the second initiation, the part to play, the part his egoic group plays in the general scheme is shown to him and this would be um, determined by the soul ray, by the soul ray. And uh, still it would be uh, on, on the higher mental plane. This group is found on the higher mental plane. It's not the same as the uh, ashramic presence, which is most likely and in most cases now found on the Buddhic plane ever since approximately 1925. He becomes more aware of the different group units with whom he is intrinsically associated. And this may, uh, this may show itself on the physical plane. Um, okay, the H, Y, well, I think I need something that will show me physical plane. Okay, so P, H, P. We'll call it that way. P, H, P. Okay. <clears throat> and I think some of us may be 
uh, have this experience that uh, at a certain point in our life we really begin to meet those with whom uh, we share the soul ray and the general purpose, um, which is uh, guided by certain ashrams to which we are gravitating. In the case of the Alice Bailey books, pretty much the ashram of Master D.K. subsumed as it is in the ashram of Master K.H. And others are there too for training purposes, even though eventually they will belong to the ashram of a master on a different race, such as Master Moria, let us say. Uh, he realizes who they are in their personalities. He meets them and recognizes them, right? He meets and recognizes them. If they are in an incarnation and he sees somewhat what are the karmic relations between groups, maybe on his own ray, um, units within the various groups and himself. So the, uh, the emergence um, of the understanding of karmic uh, relations. He is given an insight into the specific group purpose and uh, its relation to other groups. So let's just say uh, an understanding of the, uh, yeah, I'll call it the interaction of the ashrams. Uh, right. A-S-H, ashrams. He can now work with added assurance. We're talking about when the second initiation takes place and his uh, intercourse with people on the physical plane becomes more certain. So there is, uh, you know, we have this uh, mental, uh, mental illumination and spiritual intelligence. Uh, both are growing and uh, thus he works. Uh, and thus he works with, uh, <clears throat> in a greater light. Uh, he can both aid them and himself in adjusting karma, and he is motivated to work out the karma that he understands exists, and therefore bring about a more rapid approach to the final liberation, whatever that is, uh, at first, the fourth degree. Uh, fourth degree? Right. Group relations are consolidated. We see that pretty much, you know, in the meditations that Master D.K. gave to his group. The first two meditations are all about <clears throat> the consolidation of group relations and the training of the group uh, astral body and the harmonization of the group units with each other. So group relations are consolidated and the plans and purposes can be furthered more intelligently. The second initiation uh, is definitely uh, an initiation of intelligence. Uh, the second initiation, an initiation of intelligence. And we know uh, that the uh, throat center is stimulated at this initiation with its relationship to mind, even though there is that transference going on between the solar plexus and the heart. As this consolidation of group relations proceeds, so, so you know, this is pretty much the, uh, the FC degree in masonry. Uh, DK talks about these. He does at least reveal the names. Uh, it's, uh, it's a degree in which brotherhood is emphasized, and it's called the fellow craft, and one works together with one's uh, uh, related group units for the welfare of the whole. So it's the second degree. The second degree in Blue Lodge Masonry is pretty much the second uh, degree uh, of the threshold, where we become a probationary initiate of the uh, second degree. So as this consolidation 
of group relations proceeds, and can we say uh, perhaps uh, it proceeds under Jupiter, one of the planets that makes whole and which is uh, an active player in the second degree. It produces on the physical plane that concerted action and that wise unity and purpose which results in the materialization of the higher ideals. Um, when we're dealing with the astral body and its elevation, we're still dealing with ideals rather than ideas, and the Jupiter has about it much of the seventh ray. Jupiter and the seventh uh, ray are involved in this consolidation and precipitation. And the adaptation of force uh, in the wise furthering of the ends of evolution and this adaptation uh, is possible because of increasing, or let's even say rapidly increasing spiritual intelligence. So this gives an idea of gains that can be expected and uh, realizations which uh, arise uh, as the second degree is taken. You know, always there is a wider a recognition of groups in which one is participating but did not realize it before before so we may face ourselves as an ego on the higher mental plane who is largely active intelligence at the first degree but then the egoic group uh, is revealed and larger and larger groups are revealed as we go along you know eventually there are seven great groups on the monadic plane uh, to one of which uh, we belong, and eventually three still greater groups on the Logoic plane, to one of which we belong, and these will be revealed at the still higher uh, initiations. Okay. Now, what about, you know, this is going through the, the process. I, I have written on these things, and they appear in Makara and uh, I've offered written commentary rather than spoken commentary actually quite a while ago. So pretty much the whole book, Initiation, Human and Solar, is uh, commented upon in a written manner. Now we know that uh, in the initiation ceremony, the giving of certain occult words is part of the process. Uh, the words given at the first, second, and third initiations and they all um, are sequential and relate to uh, the rising planes as we would expect at the first initiation, which is uh, dealing with the etheric physical vehicle and is Lemurian in nature, at least symbolically, uh, at the first initiation is given the word for the physical plane. And I assume that, you know, involves the etheric plane. At the second initiation is given the word for the astral plane, and at the third initiation is given the word for the lower mental plane. I suppose at the fourth initiation is given the word for the higher mental plane, which allows the dissolving of the uh, causal body and the uh, fixation of the consciousness onto the Buddhic plane. And these words control uh, certain lives on each of the planes indicated. These words control certain lives uh, on the planes indicated. Probably, you know, it's possible not to remember these impartations, uh, especially at the first and second degree. And by the third degree, we're supposed to remember. But from some of the things that have been said, it looks like it's even possible not to remember, such as the condition of the brain uh, cells and their retentive capacity. You know, we, we recall, uh, as we read of FCD, uh, freedom from ties, chaleship, and detachment, and that was 
you know, Roberto Sajoli that there was a very important um, interview, probably related, you know, to the, his possibilities as a developing world savior um, with Master Kutumi, but the Tibetan had to, in a way, refresh his memory and go through some of the exactitude of that which occurred. So even though there are generalities that we can speak of regarding um, certain tendencies to remember or not remember, uh, these things are uh, rules which may not apply to everybody at all times. All right, so the secret of the sea of the ocean is unfolded at the second initiation. So many of these uh, internal uh, recognitions exist within us on the inner planes, but we have a tough time, I think, uh, bringing them through onto the outer plane or into the brain consciousness. And we have to get better and better at doing that. At the second initiation, the secret of the sea, you know, we have the desert, the sea, and we have the fires. Uh, across the desert, uh, over all the seas, and through the fires, which separate him from the veiled and hidden door. So the secret of the seas is unfolded to him, and through this revelation, two subjects of profound interest become clarified to his inner vision uh, within the causal body, which uh, at first is the chamber of initiation. And they are the mystery of the astral light, and presumably one can learn to read in this light if one follows the necessary developmental process. Uh, interesting, it's, uh, part of it is related to vegetarianism, and the second kingdom is the vegetable kingdom, so concentration upon that kingdom will, um, for food source, will help to open up some of the mysteries uh, of the astral light and some of the mysteries of the Akashic uh, record. And then also um, the law of karma, which I suppose that man's present stage of development has much to do with his emotional uh, orientations. He is after this in a position to do two things, without which he cannot work off of that which hinders and thus achieve liberation. Notice the emphasis upon work. We work off our karma, and um, Saturn is involved in the working off of karma. Uh, and we have to say Saturn, the planet of work, <laughs> okay, and of hard labor, so to speak. He can read the Akashic records, at least he can uh, from the inner planes, and ascertain the past, thereby enabling him to work intelligently in the present. We don't blunder on through an incomplete or distorted knowledge of karmic origins. We understand what is necessary, what relationships are necessary, what is to be gained by those relationships, what is to be paid by those relationships. And he can begin to balance his karma uh, and I think what we're going to see is a uh, note how important Libra is in this second initiation. Libra does have uh, associated with it uh, not only the third ray, but I think it's hinted through uh, divine understanding um, that the second ray is there. You know, if we went to, <laughs> where would we go, right? If we went here in the, <laughs> okay, so I will try to make this a little bigger, quite a bit bigger really, and I went to the astrology book, and I went to page, let's say, 333, uh, we would see that Libra offers for the initiate divine love. Balance attain divine love and understanding. So there is the hint, I think, that Libra carries with it uh, 
second ray potentials and not only first ray potentials. Okay, so um, he can begin to balance his karma to work off his obligations, you know, we've done unto others and sometimes we have to correct it. And the golden rule is Libran, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's found in so many religions and to understand how karma in the three worlds can be negated. Now, these are often, uh, let's just say, our inner understandings. And um, they may or may not be consciously transferred to awareness in the physical brain. <coughs> But increasingly, excuse me, with sensitization, they are uh, transferred into physical brain awareness. So it's interesting. What's interesting is that the, these initiations give us far more um, than that of which we may be aware on the outer planes. Interiorly, they equip us, and uh, bringing through their bestowal is the hard part, and uh, requires sensitization. And then our gifts, as they exist inwardly, will be revealed to us as within our possession. Okay. Um, but that will take uh, the period following the initiation uh, in which we work these things out and through. And that's why, you know, sometimes people say, well, you take all five initiations at once. But what's missing there is the opportunity to uh, work these things through into uh expression on the outer plane. So it's most unlikely, at least in consideration of what is uh, offered as the truth by Master Decay. Hmm. Okay. Now let's look at the effect of initiation on the centers. Uh, before initiation, all the centers will be rotating in fourth dimensional order. Now, you know, uh, maybe this means something like the wheel turning upon itself. Um, I guess we would have to see it. But after initiation, they become flaming wheels seen clairvoyantly and of rare beauty and uh, eventually turning in all directions simultaneously. Um, so this is, you know, the inner and objective uh, result of the conferral of the necessary energy. We have to work our way into accurate clairvoyance, uh, and along the way we may have something of that clairvoyance, but is it accurate, and has it been purified? The fire of Kundalini is then awakened, I suppose, as it is for each of the initiations, according to a certain path and intensity. I'll put that in. According to a, according to a certain path and intensity. We can't have the full intensity operating uh, at all of the initiations. Oh my goodness, I can't seem to spell that word. And is progressing in the necessary spirals. Now there is a big hint, a big hint about how Kundalini rises. How, uh, okay, in 10, in intensity. The emotional, uh, at the second initiation, there are, we know, emotional centers. Uh, if we were to look here on, um, we see on in the emotional body that there are chakras, 
as well, and they probably underlie and fit within and uh, in general substand the etheric chakras and so forth. It's not that they are necessarily placed elsewhere in space, and that's a big hint too when we think about our planet, our planetary globes and chains. I think the factor of occult superimposition uh, has to be reckoned with, so we don't necessarily have to go out there looking for these um, areas as if they were spread around in space. It's just that entree into them uh, probably has different vibrational keys. I hope I'm understood in proposing that. At the second initiation, the emotional centers are similarly awakened, and at the third initiation, those on the mental plane are touched, and this, uh, these are the centers on the lower mental plane. The, the initiate can then stand in the presence of the great king, the one initiator, uh, though not in the fullness of that presence. But, uh, but um, in the presence uh, as a mediated uh, through the symbol of the five-pointed star. Hmm. FEPS, I think that's a good one. And we'll do it this way. FEPS, five pointed star. Later the eye and then later face to face. So obviously there's an ongoing, uh, there uh, is an ongoing intensification of that uh, presence with uh, each succeeding initiation, especially from the third to the fifth initiations. Now at the sixth initiation we're told, you know, one of those really obscure and arcane references that another being, no doubt the an emanation of the planetary logos, but yet another being that is not Sanat Kumara is the initiator, and then at the seventh it's the planetary logos himself in in fullness, I suppose, who is the initiator. As far as the 8th and ninth, it is not particularly given. Okay. So I think where we are, we're in letters on occult meditation here. Um, we're moving on alphabetically through the different uh, books. But what we're supposed to do with this kind of topical study is to uh, be stimulated by a juxtaposition which is different from the horizontal reading uh, of the text as it is normally presented, and then maybe new ideas flash forth. And in the accumulation of these ideas and their interrelationship, and their being made into a wholeness under Jupiter, we uh, have that uh, quality of the uh, divine pattern the second ray, the ray of the divine pattern. We see it all uh, with meticulous entirety uh, as properly interrelated uh, in the light of pure reason from the Buddhic plane. All right, here we are, uh, sort of uh, onward, you know. Um, I'm just uh, really so interested here in why I don't see anything <laughs> when, I, when it comes to what's down on this level. Uh -uh. Maybe I just will not. But somehow, um, hmm, maybe if I, if I do this and I'll collapse the ribbon, no, that's not going to do any good. So I better go back to collapsing the ribbon and, oops, that's not going to be very good. I have to come back to, uh, oh, let's pause just for a moment here.
Well, I will figure it out before long, but uh, not at this moment. Okay, so now we're dealing with the uh, rays, which are uh, upon which initiations are taken. I think this is very interesting, though the material is a little bit uh, contradictory from time to time. Those who are, who are preparing for the first and second initiations, um, there's the transference of people from one ray to another. It is only an apparent transference, even though it entails passing into the group of a different master. I mean, and this takes place after the second initiation. And maybe we should look at this. It's on page 267 uh, of initiation, excuse me, of the Letters on Occult Meditation. And in order to say it, so uh, <coughs> let's look at this. Um, there are groups found formed around a master and are enclosed in his aura and are part of his consciousness, and they include people whose egoic ray is the same as his or whose monadic ray is the same as his. And is it the same as his soul ray or as his monadic ray? So this is really interesting. This means two types of people are concerned. Those who are preparing for the first and second initiation uh, taken on the ray of the ego. And this is what's missing from this other reference. And those who are preparing for the next two initiations, uh, three and four, I guess, which are taken on the ray of the monad. And you have here the cause of transference of people from one ray to another. It's only an apparent transference, even though it entails passing into the group of a different master and this uh, movement onto the monadic ray or um, into uh, an ashram where your monadic ray is somehow emphasized that takes place, he says, after the third initiation. But elsewhere, he tells us that all three of the first initiations, uh, all three uh, preliminary initiations, one, two, and three, are taken upon the ray of the ego. And really, the ray of the ego remains very strong all the way, uh, I think, even up to the fifth initiation, because the triad is liberated from the, the triad is liberated uh, from the uh, causal body, but still maintains its particular um, permanent atom focus, which is basically the same as the ray of the soul. So let's just say the secondary ray of the triad, if I have a secondary soul, the secondary ray of the triad is going to be um, the second ray, and that secondary second ray will remain even after the causal body is gone. So uh, it's important to read here on page 267, and I think we will... Uh, um, you know, have more of that later when we actually get into that uh, particular book. So what I'm going to do here um, is, yes, so I'm going to elaborate this and keep a more full record of what is actually being said. Now, you know, in general, I think that it's quite safe to say, given this particular statement, that if we've taken the second degree, our monadic ray um, is now going to be the ray on which we take the next initiation. Now, there's a little, now I, I think certainly we will take our fourth initiation upon the monadic ray largely. It's then that we have a particularly uh, closer relationship to the monad than we have had before that because the causal body 
is going to be uh, out of the way. So, you know, do pay attention here to 267. Uh, it's always a, an area that I have found very, uh, very useful and very indicative and and shows the changes that we may find occurring in our orientation. Now, you know, talk, talk about changes for just a second. Um, when we're working with the personality and we suddenly find ourselves interested in things that correlate more with our soul, then we can uh, assume that the soul ray is becoming quite prominent. Now, somewhere DK said that we're going to follow, uh, for the last third of our series of lives, we're going to follow professions or ways of expressing in the world that are more correlated with our soul ray than with our personality ray. And people will begin to feel that struggle in a change of life, a change of orientation in the middle of their otherwise quite stable personality life. And it'll mean that the soul ray is becoming prominent. And then they're going to have that tussle, that back and forth between the orientation of the personality ray, which may be well established and quite effective, and the um, orientation of the soul ray. Well, now we're going to go another step and see something similar. There is a soul ray orientation, but after the second degree, and certainly after the third, the monadic ray is going to exert quite a pull. Uh, remember that the second degree does correlate with the plane of the monad. So we can call the astral plane 6-2, and we can call the monadic uh, plane 2-6, two, two and maybe that will, uh, that will tell us something. Okay. Now I'm doing my best to, uh, yes, there we go. <laughs> All right, uh, my chronometer tells me how close I am to one hour, and I don't usually hit it on the head, you know, even five minutes more or a couple of minutes less does occur, but I hope it'll still be uh, within range of listenability. So, so, you know, people who know they have taken the second initiation should be alert to see if there is some kind of change in orientation which contrasts what they know to be their soul ray with what they suspect to be their monadic ray. And oftentimes the change of orientation at first will indicate, let's just say it's a, uh, what, what is the ray? If you're a personality and suddenly you have a different kind of orientation on a different ray, maybe it is the soul ray that you weren't sure of before. Or if, you know, you're sure of your soul ray and then suddenly there's a different orientation, um, maybe it does indicate what the monadic ray is. All right. That's my little attempt to explain these things. And I guess we have to kind of pass through it um, in order to uh, understand it in a more intimate manner. Uh, here's another statement that the uh, perception is only phenomenal until the second initiation. Okay, the first group, uh, this is from Letters, uh, Light of the Soul, and Alice Bailey is writing here, based upon translations of the Yoga Sutras that DK has provided, uh, of yogans whose perception is only phenomenal, might be regarded as compromising all who are treading the path of discipleship and covers the time from their entrance upon the probationary path until they have taken the second initiation. So there's a kind of a, with respect to the ashram, a kind of cutoff point there when you take the second initiation. The second group is uh, comprised of those higher disciples, let's call them advanced disciples, who having controlled and transmuted the entire lower nature, the entire lower nature, make a contact with their monad, spirit or father in heaven, and discern what the monad perceives. Well, this begins somewhat uh, in the period, somewhat in the period 
between the second initiation and the and the third initiation, though it becomes far more conscious after the third initiation than really quite uh, intimate and immediate at the period of the fourth initiation. So there, there's no question that the second initiation is a um, is a high point in a way, and that's why DK was able to say to that uh, student ISGL that uh, yes, you're taking the second initiation if you if you will follow instructions, and uh, therefore we rate you highly. Remember that the second, third, and fourth, according to DK in, in Initiation Human and Solar, page 84, 85, can be taken in the same life or immediately afterwards. And as I said, that's the amazing thing. Uh, so here we are eliminating impure substance. There's a cleansing at the second degree, isn't there? It's baptism in the Jordan, so there's a general cleansing, assimilation, and protection during the initiations. Uh, this is Alice Bailey writing, we remember. It should be most carefully borne in mind that this purity, you remember there's purification by water and then by fire, and at the, uh, uh, the downpouring of the fire at the Pentecost, that was the introduction of group fiery purification, which uh, uh, the, uh, the Christ sent to overshadow and descend upon his disciples in the upper room, symbolically. Uh, this purity concerns the substance out of which each of these vehicles is composed. So we do need to get them vibrating to a higher rate. And as progress goes on, the focus is on subplane after subplane. And the rate of vibration of the vehicle as a whole is elevated. So there has to be the elimination of impure substance or of those atoms and molecules which limit the free expression of spirit, presumably by too low a vibration, as we're told, you know, don't have anything to do with um, matter of the sixth and seventh subplanes on the astral plane. They don't really belong in your vehicle at all, we're told. So they certainly would limit the free expression of soul spirit and which confine it to the form so that it can have neither free ingress or egress. Well, we, we talk about being able to come and go, and that's a Neptunian astral thing. And pretty much by the time the, um, the sixth pedal is open, one can come and go. The time the sixth pedal of the, of the uh, egoic lotus is open, one uh, can come and go and make way for a higher teacher. Uh, who, oh, goodness. Who can teach through one's uh, vehicles? So, um, otherwise, the atoms of lower vibration halt the egress. You, you cannot come and go. Okay. So, we're talking about purity. Purity of substance. And, you know, that is pretty much an issue of transmutation. And uh, we have the other factors, transformation and transfiguration. But transmutation deals with the quality of the matter itself. We have assimilation of those atoms and molecules, which will tend to provide a form through which spirit can adequately function. And this is the, uh, sorry, the indrawing of matter of higher vibration on the sound of the ohm or in other ways and the protection of the purified form from contamination and deterioration and these are the we might call them the rules of right maintenance and those are given uh, to those who uh, have to use them and i suppose much Frequent use of the Om is prophylactic in that respect. On the path of purification or of probation, that's another name for the probationary path, this eliminative process is uh, commenced. 
uh, on the path of discipleship, you know, and what do we want to say, you know, should we say perhaps beginning with accepted discipleship? The rules for the constructive or assimilative process are learnt and on the path of initiation. After the second initiation, the protective uh, maintenance work, we might say, is, um, is begun. So we do have to see to the uh, vibratory purity of our uh, vehicles. And I'm sure that as this uh, work goes on, the master will give the necessary hints or the soul will so that one can follow these three steps uh, to purify, to draw in matter of the higher substance, uh, higher vibratory possibilities, and then to maintain that high vibration. It's always possible to fall down that's the problem and initiates uh, do lower their vibration from time to time and become a lesson unto themselves and to others okay so moving on the the soul submerges the astral nature right okay during the second initiation um <coughs> a very important book here telepathy in the etheric vehicle I find, you know, I'm sure we all do, that there are some books in which we have not spent as much time, and this is one for me. There comes a moment during the second initiation when the soul of the initiate sweeps into activity and fundamental force. Um, if I might so use the term, and, uh, and fundamental force submerges the astral nature vitalizing and inspiring the astral body, changing temporarily the quality of the astral aura and establishing a control which will lead finally to the substitution which I have mentioned above. You know, it's uh, bringing in high uh, atoms of high vibration and ejecting atoms of low vibration, thus giving the internal soul spirit uh, flexibility to um, enter withdraw and enter. This is an aspect of the truth which underlies the doctrine of vicarious atonement, and it's certainly a lot different from the uh, vicarious uh, atonement that we have uh, understood before. You know, there's some, let's just call it uh, some grace in the initiatory uh, process and it is engineered by the soul, by the descending soul. So uh, new levels of tension are instituted, uh, but the question is how easily are they maintained and that's up to the um, individual after the initiatory uh, process his work after the initiatory process. There's a lot of stabilization that has to occur, at least uh, in the initiatory process itself, in, in the, um, the moments of high contact, we are given the vision of what it can be like. We're raised to a point of higher vision, and then maybe we settle back into the condition that we've been sustaining, but we've never internally forgotten that elevation of vision and the new possibilities. And towards it, we work uh, in a Saturn period between initiations. Uh, we work on our own to reestablish that which we have been shown, and maybe unconsciously, and maybe there's some deep memory within us of what we have been shown, and that deep memory is very motivating and uh, unconsciously and by our own efforts, we work towards uh, reestablishing that great sense of vision and uh, the greater capacity which has been given to us for a few short moments. 
So there comes a moment during the second initiation, maybe it occurs during others as well, when the soul of the initiate sweeps into activity and fundamental force submerges the astral nature, uh, changing it, you know. So I'm going to uh, vitalizing and inspiring the astral body. Uh, these uh, initiations are pretty well taken in the causal body, but sometimes uh, we tend later to feel the effects in one body or another, because after all, they're not disconnected on the inner planes. So uh, the way ahead is shown. And uh, we are saved by a higher aspect of ourself. And it's, uh, it's not that we have to beg this aspect to descend. It, it naturally does and uplifts us. Okay. Now we are, there's apparently only one reference there. I wonder uh, if it is so. Makes me want to, you know, kind of go into the Alice Bailey books here and look at uh, what we might call, um, okay, I'll just 165, that's way too high, 165, and in telepathy on the etheric vehicle, now I'm going to look for second, initiation, and there is only one reference, so that must be what it is. Okay. <clears throat> now, moving on. This is the most interesting section here. It's in a treatise on cosmic fire and talks about the different kinds of forces that we can find associated with the uh, different logoi. So, um, the effects of the Lords of the Rays in Shambhala, yes, and uh, from a higher perspective within the different planetary logoi who are Ray Lords, the, uh, and these should be memorized, I think, because they really do tell us something about the names of the Ray Lords. The magical force of the seventh logos is found at the first initiation. So who is the seventh logos? Is it Uranus from the soul perspective? Um, it's certainly the seventh ray lord within Shambhala who's receiving uh, uh, an inflow of force from the, the sacred logos of the seventh ray in our solar system. Now notice here, um, the word aggressive, which sounds very Martian. The aggressive fire of the sixth logos is felt at the sixth initiation. And that uh, sounds a lot like Mars and tells us that Mars will be necessarily involved in this initiation, even though the, uh, with Pluto and Vulcan, I believe, even though the planets um, usually considered in relation to this initiation are uh, Venus, uh, Jupiter, and Neptune. The illuminating light of the fifth logos is felt at the third initiation, and this is the, we might call it, uh, in a way, the cause of transfiguration, and the reason why uh, the light sublime uh, begins to come into focus, uh, it, and we might say, you know, okay, is this Venus? We might say. The harmonizing life of the fourth Logos is felt at the fourth uh, initiation. Interesting that the heart is involved there as the major chakra, and the idea of the cross and the harmonizing of the human and deva kingdom is occurring on the buddhic plane uh, as that plane begins to be accessed at the fourth initiation remember the word bud buddhi it involves mercury which is the fourth ray soul so is this 
the uh, Mer Mercurian logos and the, of course, the Ray Lord that is in Shambhala associated as the receiver of that type of force. Remember that planets do give off more than one ray, and it just depends on when in the development of the uh, initiatory development of the human being. Um, the timing will determine which ray is received. I mean, Mercury gives off higher rays as well, and so does Venus. But maybe at this point, we're still pretty much dealing with the soul ray of the uh, advancing initiate. The blending power of the third logos is felt at the fifth initiation. That's kind of interesting, the word blending. But then think about um, think about the ways in this map here. Maybe if I can go sort of over here to, there it is. Um, how the, if we look at it, under the Mahachohan and under uh, the Venetian master, all of these are blended together and four, five, six, and seven are considered to be aspects of the third ray and these outposts of the ray are related to still higher uh, ray lords, to the ray lords in Shambhala, and also to the third ray of active intelligence here. So, yes, uh, the blending power of the third logos. But who is that? Is that Saturn? Because, you know, once you be begin to become aware that there are soul rays of... Uh, of different uh, planetary logoi, and there are monadic rays and personality rays, you begin to wonder which you should use. So can we, can we really be talking of Saturn? And uh, it's uh, probable third ray soul, maybe. And here is the unifying heat of the second Logos, are we talking about Jupiter, uh, is felt at the sixth initiation. Certainly, Jupiter is in interesting because it's a, a planet of travel and expansion. <laughs> and that's exactly what begins to happen here at the sixth initiation. And it um, <clears throat> blends into a unity many different factors. It unifies, we might say, uh, Jupiter unifies many factors into a oneness and it has uh, probably a second ray soul whatever its uh, monadic ray might be maybe along the seventh ray line or well there's some mysteries about the rays as we ascend. But here is the dynamic electricity of the first Logos is felt at the seventh initiation. But now the word electricity, this word suggests Uranus. It is the most electrical of the planets and it does have the first ray monad. And certainly uh, monadic quality of these sources uh, would be received in relation to such a high initiation as the mm, as the seventh seventh initiation so maybe and maybe even um, when we look at um, the sixth initiation, could be Neptune, you know, Neptune could be involved here. Neptune with its uh, second ray monad could be involved. Neptune definitely has the second ray monad. And then the Saturn has the third ray monad. Saturn has the third ray uh, hmm. I'm going to make that 
third ray monad. Um, and so maybe the third ray soul and the third ray monad as well. Third ray monad, third ray monad. I think we're okay. Okay. So maybe the maybe the synthesizing planets are involved with the monadic ray are involved with the uh, <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> MDC with the monadic ray uh, for the fifth, sixth, and seventh initiations. But it still has you wondering uh, what will be considered then the magical force of the seventh logos, because Uranus is ray one um, from monadic consideration, but ray seven from a soul consideration. So does it appear twice? Does Uranus appear twice? Well, we begin to see that. Um, <clears throat> that this is not maybe quite so straightforward uh, as it looks. So third ray monad. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm looking here. Third ray and a TDR. That's it. Okay. Third ray monad. There we go. Okay. Well, what is uh, there? There is no non sacred planet of the seventh ray. There is no non sacred planet of the fifth ray. So we may be uh, forced to use one planet uh, twice, Uranus once in its soul ray perspective, and then Uranus in its monadic ray perspective. But I think what is interesting here is to, um, you know, use these adjectives, magical, aggressive, illuminating, uh, along with the various planetary logoi, logoic qualities, harmonizing, blending, although it's hard to think of Saturn as blending, uh, unifying, certainly Jupiter or Neptune would, would fit there, and dynamic, uh, Uranus certainly fits there. So the adjectives are very important when thinking of the ray source. Uh, when thinking of the ray source. Okay, well, hopefully I haven't gotten off into a kind of complexity there that cannot be resolved. I think the adjectives are the important thing, and the kind of uh, energy that comes in at the different initiations, magical, illuminating, magical, aggressive, uh, illuminating, harmonizing, blending, unifying, dynamic. Uh, when we're thinking about each of these initiations, this page, 433, is an important one. Okay, then that's going to be it. A little bit over, I think. So um, we'll call this the end of uh, second initiation compilation program number five. Uh, and our day today is the 17th of June. And then uh, beginning of <clears throat> second initiation um, commentary program number six. And when that will take place, we don't know, but hopefully it will take place yet today. All right. We have a lot to, a lot to think about. I, and uh, the important thing is when we're taking an initiation or preparing for it. What is the nature of the force which will be flowing in and with which Ray Lord is it associated and with which greater solar systemic planetary 
Raylord, is it associated? And why is that the case? Okay. All of these things are factors uh, to be carefully considered. So we'll see you soon. And uh, let's all study hard to assimilate this material and have it come within and actually really begin to make sense, even though, of course, it's a stretch and much of, a, much of it is beyond us. But uh, still, when we incorporate it, it will go through some interesting internal alchemy and realization uh, may well result. See you soon. Bye-bye.